Hi, I'm Jim White from the Southwest Church of Christ. I'm the senior minister here. Welcome to our class. Uh, we have been studying outrageous claims of the Bible. We're on lesson number 10. And uh, today we're going to talk about random acts of kindness. Uh, really talk about the golden rules, what we're going to talk about. You've heard the term random acts of kindness, I'm sure. Uh, I think they may even have a random act of kindness day where you're supposed to, and, and people have even promoted that uh, every day that you do something out of just kindness that you do for someone. And it may be as simple as holding a door or something like that. But um, random acts of kindness have been kind of one of those things that we've promoted uh, and, and it's kind of interesting because it's almost as if we've got to make an effort to do that. And really, that's what the Christian life is all about. Um, and a, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what's been called the golden rule. The golden rule, there are certain uh, verses, passages in the Bible, even stories in the Bible that everybody seems to know. Everybody seems to know the story of of uh, David and Goliath. Everybody seems to know the story of Jonah. Um, people use the term Doubting Thomas, we're going to talk about uh, in the sermon on Sunday. Um, but everybody seems to know what the golden rule is. But it's kind of interesting because even though people may think they know what the golden rule is, I'm not sure they understand uh, the complete ramifications of that. It's found in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. It's in the famous Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. A couple of things. First of all, he says, so in everything. It's kind of interesting to me. It's everything. It doesn't leave out anything at all. Uh, in everything. And then he says to do to others as you would have them do to you. And he says this sums up uh, everything about the law and the prophets. Um, it's kind of interesting because uh, when Jesus is asked about um, the greatest commandment, we're going to talk about that, I think, in this lesson. Um, but when Jesus is asked about the, the greatest commandment, he says the greatest commandment is to love God with everything you've got. I'm paraphrasing here. And the second one uh, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says all of the law and prophets hang on those two things. And so you've got to make the assumption that the golden rule has to do uh, with, with what Jesus says later on about loving God with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, most people don't see it that way. They don't see uh, the golden rule in, in the way that it's written or the way that Jesus said it. Most people read the golden rule as don't do to others as you wouldn't have done to you. Um, we might as well just say, just leave me alone. Uh, leave me to my own devices. But this passage, this command, this golden rule, as it's called, really shows the love and the compassion and the caring that Jesus calls us all to do. Um, nobody taught the way Jesus did. I uh, pulled this from Lee Strobel's book on outrageous claims in the Bible. And uh, it's, it's interesting. Listen to what he says here. He kind of has a, a list. He starts off by saying, 500 years before Jesus was born, someone asked Confucius, is there one word that may serve as a rule of practice for all one's life? And Confucius replied, is not reci reciprocity such a word? What, do you, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. There's that negative part of that. 400 years before Christ, a philosopher in Athens taught, whatever angers you when you suffer at the hands of others, do not do to others. 
Uh, and again, there is that negative. If, if it makes you mad, then, then don't do to other people. About 300 years before Christ, the Stoics had a teaching that said, what you do not want to be done to you, do not do to anyone else. And then roughly 200 years before Christ, the author of the Tabit, which is part of the Apocrypha, wrote this particularly succinct version, what thou thyself hatest to no man do. And so you see the difference in this, um, the, the, the negative part of this compared to what Jesus said, which was much more positive. Everybody else says, if you don't like it done to you, then don't do it to someone else. Jesus says, whatever you want or, or, or whatever way you want to be treated, that's the way that you treat other people. Uh, do unto others as you would have done to you. And so it's a whole lot more positive take on that uh, than anybody else, any of the philosophers, anybody that, that wrote before concerning this. A few years ago, and it's been several years ago, it was when my kids were young, uh, my family took a trip to San Diego and we went over and saw uh, Hotel Del Coronado, I believe is the name of it. And if you walk the beaches uh, out there near the hotel, uh, you'll see this beautiful, beautiful uh, sparkling in the sand. It looks very gold and it's called fool's gold. And it looks like gold, but it's not really gold. And sometimes I think that, that these philosophers, the way that they uh, put this is really fool's gold. Now, obviously the golden rule, uh, the, the title of that, the name of that was given by humans. Uh, but yet it, it indicates really something that's very uh, precious and very rare. In, in especially in our society today. Uh, and as I said, we tend to take the negative view, but the real golden rule is selfless generosity, as Lee Strobel calls it. Under the negative version, you could live a passive life. You could do whatever you wanted to as far as don't hurt me and I won't hurt you, and you could live a detached life. Put me behind closed doors. I won't mess with you. Don't mess with me. Uh, that doesn't sound very much like uh, what Christ has called us to. We're called to go on the offensive. A uh, Christian scholar by the name of D.A. Carson said this. The negative form would teach behavior like this. If you do not enjoy being robbed don't rob others. If you do not like being cursed, don't curse others. If you do not care to be clubbed over the head, don't club others over the head. However, the positive form teaches behavior like this. If you enjoy being loved, love others. If you like to receive things, give to others. If you like being appreciated, appreciate others. The positive form is thus far more searching than its negative counterpart. There's no permission in this to withdraw into a world in which I offend no one. Um, but let me give you an example of maybe some things you could do. And we're going to talk a little bit about this as we go through this. Um, I, I like notes. I'm not asking that you write me a note, but um, if you like receiving notes, then why don't you write a note to someone? Um, that's kind of the thinking that we're talking about. Whatever you like, do it. Uh, especially in this time of COVID when we're isolated, when we don't see each other very much, and when we do see each other, uh, we only see half their, their face. We have to stay a certain distance away. There's no hugging. Uh, we tend to uh, pound elbows. Uh, but you can really write something that, that's poignant, that's, 
that's kind, that's nice. And uh, if you do that, then I'm sure people would appreciate that. Encouragement right now is extremely valuable. And if the world would abide by the golden rule, there'd be no office politics. We wouldn't have to lock our doors at night. Uh, there'd be no terrorism, no starvation, no genocide, anything like that. And you see how effective this could be if the entire world would just understand it and take hold of it. There'd be forgiveness, there'd be compassion, there'd be peace, there'd be goodwill. Oh, and for goodness sake, there'd be good manners. But you know as well as I do, the world is not like that. In fact, in many cases, the world is totally opposite. Of that. We tend to live in a selfish world. I remember Jerry Jones when he was in here several years ago, Dr. Jones. Um, he was talking about marriages and he said the number one problem in marriages is selfishness. And I remember hearing that statement and really wondering about it, but then when I considered it, isn't that true? Uh, we want our way, we want the food that we want, when we want it. Uh, there's a certain way that we like things, and if we don't get it, we get upset. Um, uh, it's, it's what's in it for me. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of like my grandchild. I've got three of them, but one of them in particular, she's at the age now that if you have a doll of hers, that's mine. Give it back. And that's kind of the way we act as adults sometimes. Uh, we act like children. And we need to, to see not only uh, people, uh, but we need to, to see people through, through God's eyes. One of my favorite passages, it's, it's fast becoming really uh, a very favorite passage of mine, is found in 1 Corinthians, or uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 5. And, and if you're around me much, you know I quote chapter 4 an awful lot, verses 16 through 18. Uh, therefore, I've got to do it right now because I always tell people, if I ever get a chance to quote my favorite verse, I will. And this one is my favorite verse. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Right after that, in, in chapter 5, is a passage uh, that talks about reconciliation. And when you start in verse 11, it says, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that not one died or that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Let me stop here for just a minute. Did you hear what he said? We're going to read more here in just a moment. Did you hear what he said? He says, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. There's that selfishness factor again, isn't it? Instead of thinking of yourself first, you think of the other person. You're not living for yourself anymore. Let's go on. Starting in verse, what is that, 16? So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new, uh, the new creation has come, and the old is gone, and the new is here. 
All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he goes on and talks a little bit about reconciliation, but I want you to hear what he says in verse 16. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, um, we see them through different eyes. We see the world through different eyes. And what he's talking about there is that we see the world through the eyes of God. Uh, I read this quote not too long ago. And uh, I, I quoted it, and, and, and unfortunately, people are giving me credit for it, but it's not me. Um, but it says uh, something like this, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. But it says, you will never look into the eyes of someone that God doesn't love. And how true is that? And so we need to, to, to value these people that we see on a daily basis and to see them. I don't care how badly they act. I don't care how big a jerk they are or if they, they're trying to undercut you. You've got to understand that God loves them. Oh, he doesn't uh, appreciate or approve of the way they treat you or other people for that matter, but he still sent his son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved the world. And who's included in the world? Everybody. And that's hard sometimes. And we start thinking, well, how could God love, and, and you, you add the name. I don't know how he can love them, but he does. And so it behooves us uh, to act as he does. And to see the value of everyone uh, in Arkansas, which uh, I claim uh, as home, um, there's an interesting state park down in the southwest corner of the state. Uh, it's called uh, Crater of the Diamonds State Park. And uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting place. I've never really been there. I think some of the congregation have been down there. But it's just this field. I've seen pictures of it. It's just a field of dirt. But the interesting thing is uh, people have found diamonds in there. I mean, valuable diamonds. Uh, I understand there's one guy who sits all day long. He just gets him a, a, a chair and he sits there and he watches as the, as the sun moves and he's, if he sees something glimmer, he sends somebody to dig. Uh, people find diamonds, especially after rains, it seems. And, and even though that it's just a pile of dirt, a pile of mud, there's something valuable in there. We tend to see people as the dirt, as a clump of clay, as a bit of dirt. But we need to realize there may be some gold in there. Um, I, one of the, the comments, I think I mentioned this last week, um, there but for the grace of God go I. Um, some people don't understand God's grace. If you do, well, give them some of yours. Because that's what we're talking about here. We used to sing a song. Uh, there was a... Uh, I, I love the old hymns. So we don't sing very much of those anymore. And we certainly don't use songbooks much anymore. And that's okay. Uh, I like the new songs, and uh, I like to sing new songs. And, and by the way, this is free. This doesn't cost you anything. There are some people that don't like the new songs at church, but you need to realize that at one, one point in your life, one time, all the songs we sing were new. Uh, and so, uh, but there's a song that we, we used to sing, and it goes, Of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the call. Where sin has gone must go his grace. The gospel is for all. And that's how we need to see everybody is worthy of the gospel. One of the low points, and I don't mean necessarily, a, uh, maybe I ought to reword that. It was a disappointing point uh, in my ministry. I was a youth minister in Louisiana, and we took a group of kids 
down to the lower part of the state. And um, we had asked them to go into some neighborhoods. And there was one neighborhood that one of our young men just said, I'm not going in there. Uh, why? I'm just not going in there. And he had a prejudice against this group of people that were in that neighborhood, and he refused to go in. He didn't fully understand, and, and I've got I've to cut him a little bit of slack because he was not uh, mature enough to see what we were just talking about, that the gospel is for all. We need to see others from their point of view. That's hard to do sometimes. The golden rule becomes the most natural response in the world once you see life from the other person's vantage point. First John is an interesting book. Of course, it was written by the Apostle John. And uh, I know I've harped on this, but someone asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, and I've already talked a little bit about this. And, and Jesus said that it was to love God with everything you've got and to love your neighbor as yourself. In the book of 1 John, uh, John just says over and over and over again, he uses a term uh, or he, he uses a phrase. He said, if, uh, if you say you're in the light but you hate your brother, you know, you lie. Uh, Jesus said, a new command I give to you that you love God one another. And, and John repeats that, basically. In fact, he says, God is love. And, and it, the way I explain this is, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like saying, uh, if you have a dictionary and you look up the word love, God's picture is going to be beside it. Obviously, we don't know what God <laughs> looks like, but uh, but I, I think we have to understand uh, that God is love and that He makes a difference in our lives. I, I, I keep bringing up Lee Strobel uh, because a lot of the material that I've covered uh, is, is from uh, his books. Uh, but, but Lee Strobel was just a, a, a sad human being, and I, I'm, I'm not being ugly here, and... Uh, by his own admission. Uh, he was a news reporter, uh, which doesn't have a very good reputation, does it? Uh, he was an attorney, uh, which is kind of a double whammy. Uh, and he was an atheist. He was all of those. And so he set out to disprove uh, that God existed. His wife became a Christian. He ridiculed her. He made fun of her. And so as he sets out to prove her wrong, he notices how she changes. And he doesn't really care for that. And that made him all the more uh, wanting to, to disprove God's existence. And it was that journey that brought him to where he is even today. No expression of compassion to another human being is a wasted effort. Let me say that again. No expression of compassion to another human being is a wasted effort. I read a story of uh, Mother Teresa. And you've, Mother Teresa was a Catholic nun who lived in the dredges of the, uh, of the poor in Calcutta. India. And um, it's said that Mother Teresa spotted a baby who had been rescued from the streets. And there was a volunteer who was there, kind of, you know, show me what you do. This baby was, was in dire need of medical help. In fact, not only was the baby in dire need, but was really beyond what anybody could do for her. And Teresa picked up the baby and handed it to this new volunteer. And she said, don't let this baby go. Don't let this child die without being loved. What had that child done to deserve anything? Eh, no, not really. She'd done nothing. And yet she deserved love. 
The volunteer said this, I held her in my arms and I loved her until she died at six o'clock in the evening. I spent the hours humming Brahms' lullaby. And do you know, I could feel that baby, as tiny and weak as she was, pressing herself against me. God calls us to be compassionate. He calls us to be more loving. I, I struggle with this very personally. Uh, my wife is much more compassionate than I. Uh, I'm, I'm cut and dried. No, you know, that person's a charlatan. That person needs to do this and that. And she seems to be a whole lot more compassionate. And, and so we need to understand that and, and as I said, if we look at someone and we see, you know, what they've been through, we're a lot more compassionate. I was reminded of this as I was watching on uh, the Internet yesterday. And I, I tend to have the sound turned down. But I saw this guy on a high dive uh, diving board. And, and he looked just like he was lumbering up there, like he could barely make it. And I, my, my initial thought was, what is this guy doing? You know, he doesn't need to be up there. If he's going to jump in the water, the water's deep. He can barely walk down this diving board. In fact, at one point he almost fell and somebody ran out and stopped him. And I thought, what is this guy doing? And he came to the edge of the board, and he just kind of leaned in and dove in. Well, my curiosity got me, so I pulled up the story. Turns out the guy, I think he had a brain tumor. He was a diving coach several years ago. And he had lost really the complete use of his right side. And so the lumbering came as a result of the fact that he couldn't move. And they said once a year he would get on that diving board and jump in. Once you know the story, you understand, and you're not quite as critical, you're not quite as judgmental. And, and I think that's what we need to realize. Uh, we we kind of tease a little bit. Uh, we say, I wonder, wonder who, you know, somebody is acting kind of... Um, I don't know, uh, just not the way they should. And we tend to say stuff like, uh, I wonder who kicked her cat this morning. Um, they got out of the wrong side of the bed. And so if we really knew some of the things that people were going through, perhaps we wouldn't be as critical and maybe we'd be more helpful. Single acts of kindness can involve any number of things. Holding a door, uh, paying it forward. I, I love that one. Uh, I've heard, or, uh, heard or read of, of uh, places like uh, Starbucks where somebody's going through the drive through and they pay for the next person behind and it just continues to go on and on. You see, these kind of things are catching. And you may not may believe that you're making a difference, but you are making a difference. And that's the way these things are. Letting someone ahead of you at the grocery store. They may have one or two items. You have a cart full and they come up behind you. Are you going to let them uh, come in or are you going to uh, make them wait until they run all of your stuff through? Talking kindly to your spouse. Remembering birthdays. I've already mentioned this. Writing a note. Telling someone how you appreciate them, encouraging, encouraging them uh, to, to do something. Or maybe you've seen them do something uh, that nobody else seemed to notice. Make a phone call. And I, I'm, an, I'm an old fogey, I know. Um, or a text message. Um, make it a personal. My, one of my pet peeves. Uh, about computers, about Facebook, about uh, text messaging, uh, especially on Facebook. And if you do this, please don't get upset with me. 
But I've seen this so much where people get on Facebook and they'll say things like, uh, today is my wife's birthday. I want you to wish her a happy birthday. She has meant so much to me and blah, 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 blah. Or this is our anniversary and uh, she is the, the most wonderful person in the world. And, and my, my question is, why don't you tell her that in person? I think that's one of the problems of the, of the world is, is we've been able to do all these things via computer, internet, texts, that we've forgotten what it's like to have that personal touch. James chapter 1, starting in verse 22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Let me make this plea to, I almost said to you, but to all of us, is let's realize what just small things like that can do to change the world and to make sure that we listen to this golden rule to do to others as we would have done to us. I hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening.